this one. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Charlie Johnson, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement with the Institute, including volunteering at programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student who would like to join, please, contacting us, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu or speaking with a student worker after the program. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel soon, and you can also access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. A loop hearing system is available uh, to use if you have a T-coil hearing aid, and we also have a limited number of listening devices. If you have questions about the loop system or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. If you are part of our virtual audience, you may submit your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. Again, that's dolequestions at ku.edu. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. Now please join me in welcoming uh, Director of Programs and Student Affairs, Sarah Stacy. Thank you so much, Charlie. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics for tonight's program called A New Cold War, America, China, and Russia After Ukraine's War, or after the Ukraine War, sorry about that. Tonight's program is presented in partnership with KU's Department of Political Science and the Center for Russian, Eastern European, and Eurasian Studies. On behalf of the Dole Institute of Politics, thank you so much for your coordination on this timely program, especially to Political Science Chair John Kennedy, who initiated the collaboration. Before I introduce tonight's guests, I have a couple of announcements. Um, please join us over the course of the next five Wednesdays for our discussion group series covering the midterm elections. It's led by former Washington editor of the Wall Street Journal, Jerry Seib. And next Wednesday on October 19th, Jerry will be joined by Sean Morales Doyle from the Brennan Center for Justice to discuss voting access and ballot integrity. So now I'd like to introduce tonight's speakers, both of whom are experts on China and international relations. So Robert Ross is a professor of political science at Boston College and associate at the John King Fairbank Center for East Asian Research at Harvard University. Among other achievements, he has been a visiting scholar at the Institute for Security Studies at Peking University, a Fulbright professor at the Chinese Foreign Affairs College and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the National Committee for U.S.-China Relations. And our own um, Jack Jung is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Kansas and director of KU's tra Trade War Lab. Before coming to KU, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at Princeton University. He has been the recipient of various grants and awards, including the Wilson China Fellowship, a Fulbright U.S. student grant, a Charles Koch Foundation Foreign Policy Research Grant, and the Smith Richardson Foundation World Politics and Statecraft Fellowship. And now, please join me in welcoming our guests. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Um, Professor Ross, uh, I've been reading your work since I was an undergraduate student, so it's a real honor to have you here uh, at KU. Uh, that's, how, that's how old I am. Right? <laughs> uh, the, or how unqualified I am. The, uh, thank you to the Dole Institute, the Department of Political Science, uh, and Crease for uh, including me uh, in this event. Um, well, we'll uh, we have a few questions uh, prepared, and then we'll leave plenty of time at the end for Q&A &A with the audience. So, 
Um, just in time for our event this evening, the Biden administration released its national security strategy. Uh, one year late due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the document mentions Russia 71 times, China 55 times, no other country comes close um, to those counts. Uh, my first question for you, Professor Ross, is has the world returned to the bipolarity of the Cold War uh, with Russia and China in one block and US and NATO in another? <clears throat> So we tend to think of the world as bipolar or multipolar. And when we do that, we talk about great powers. <clears throat> but Tip O'Neill once said that all politics is local. And in international politics, we say all great power politics are regional. So I don't think it would say the world is bipolar. But certainly, East Asia is now bipolar. We've got two great powers, and we say China is a rising power. It's not rising anymore. In many respects, it is the American equal, near equal, or in some respects, more capable than the United States in East Asia. And of course, East Asia is a vital region to both of us. Uh, East Asia fronts the West Coast and Hawaii, the United States, across the Pacific Ocean, most dynamic economic region in the world, and a rising power in the region, and of course, for China, it's your backyard. So that competition, that struggle, that great power politics within East Asia is, is sufficient when we speak about bipolarity. Um, the world's more complicated. China's not a player in Russia, in Europe. It's not a player in Latin America or even the Middle East yet. But as far as the United States is concerned, it's Asia, and Asia is all that matters. So diving into this a little bit more, I think commentators recently have made much of the Putin C no limits friendship, right? Um, are Russia and China then allies? Um, and where, uh, if so, where do their interests align? And, and where do that, they diverge if you, if you wouldn't characterize them sure. as well, alliance? Two things there. The uh, National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, on national TV, suggested that he thought that Putin may have lied to Xi Jinping about his plans for the Ukraine. And therefore, China, Xi Jinping was more than happy to say our friendship is, is without limits. And then the next thing you know, Xi Jinping, uh, Putin drags Xi Jinping into a European conflict. So I don't think Xi Jinping was very happy with the outcome of that summit and what Putin did to China. Having said that, um, there are two parts to this. Um, there is the, what we would call the material aspects of Russia-China cooperation over Ukraine. And the Chinese have been about as good as anyone else at refraining from cooperating with Putin. The Indians have not been very cooperative. The Germans have been buying an awful lot of natural gas and oil. So our ally in NATO, Turkey, has been anything but cooperative. And about 80% of the world doesn't follow the sanctions whatsoever. So in that respect, the Chinese, if you will, have kept their nose clean. And indeed, every so often, you'll get a European leader or even an American leader to say that point blank. The Chinese have been fairly good. But at the rhetorical level, at the level of diplomacy, they've been forward-leaning in um, giving public support to Putin. Now, in, in, in our world, where I live, uh, we say that's cheap talk. You know, you can say anything you want, you can see and have all the diplomacy you want, but beneath that diplomacy, the Chinese have been fairly cooperative. Now, make no mistake, they are not being cooperative to help out the United States. Um, rather, they see it in their interest to do so. Um, but they have been quite supportive of the Russians um, at the diplomatic level. And, and one way to address this is the expectation might be that the, um, we should be able to count on Chinese support against Russian aggression in Ukraine. And one perspective we need to keep in mind is that it's not helpful to think of a policy emanating from a country from the minds of its leaders. We need to think of political relationships, just as we might in the United States, and how the politics is creating policies on both sides. So in the expectation of Chinese support, for the United States, we need to remember that beginning in about 2018, the United States started a trade war against China. We started a tech war against China. We started a human rights war against China. And we have fundamentally transformed our Taiwan policy. And of course, this has all picked up pace and intensity under Biden. Then a war breaks out in Europe. And mind you, this is a European war, not a global war. And then we turn to the Chinese and ask for their help. It's a little rich, right? I mean, after you start a Cold War, and then you say, but we'd like your help in the Ukraine. 
And so that the Chinese, we say they have been cooperative, but in many respects, you'd have to expect even more. So that by their own interests, they've been rather restrained in how much they help Putin, because the help has been fairly irrelevant in helping him fight a war. Now, when we use the word alliance in my world, an alliance is a formal legal commitment to go to war on behalf of someone else if that someone else is attacked. This is not an alliance. Not only that, but even if we we're informal, it's hard to imagine the Chinese ever going to war to support Russia anywhere. And it's hard to imagine the Russians being able to offer China support in any war that the Chinese might fight, because if the Chinese might fight a war, it would be in, in the Far East, in Northeast Asia, and the Russians can't even fight a war on their most capable borders, nonetheless help the Chinese in East Asia when there are maybe seven million people in the entire Russian Far East with no roads, no energy, no airports to speak of, no naval capabilities. So when the Chinese look at Russia, they don't see a great power. One way to think of the Sino-Russian relationship is to think of how Americans look at Canada. Right? We'd never see Canada as, as an equal. You know, they've got 20, 30 million people up there, right? Well, that's about how the Chinese look at Russia. It's a weak country of no consequence in Northeast Asia because there are 8 million people on the border of 1.4 billion people. And who's got a better infrastructure? Who's got a better navy? Who's got a better army? Who's got an economy, much less a larger economy? That would be China. So when the Chinese look at Russia, they look at a fairly weak, inconsequential country, which is, of course, the way they like it. We like having Canada as a neighbor, right? And the Chinese like having Russia as a neighbor because they don't have to worry about Russia. So alliance is rather strong because the Russians can offer no help to the Chinese whatsoever, and the Chinese are not about to help the Russians if it would mean trouble in the Far East. So non-alliance, the interests align uh, in, in this growing rivalry with the United States. So then looping back to that first question, then if, if what you were saying is, you know, it's not a, uh, you know, we're not at a bipolar world uh, globally, if China and Russia grow increasingly aligned, doesn't that look like a global bipolarity as well, like a block? Well, we're fighting a proxy war in Europe, right. and China's not part of it, and China's not helping the Russians. And then we're simultaneously trying to contain China and East Asia. And so for America, it's a global battle. And we're not picking our battles very well. We're picking two at once. It's not a good way to allocate your resources. But for America, yes, it's a global battle having two great powers, if you will, or two conflicts simultaneously. For China, it's Asia, Asia, Asia. They have not rocked the boat anywhere else in the world of any significance because it's all about Asia. <coughs> now, I'll qualify that by saying we started a trade war, we started a tech war, we started a human rights war, and we we're undermining 40 years of Taiwan policy. They're not helping us on Iran. They are stiffening Iran's back in negotiations we have with Iran on the non-proliferation treaty. Um, but again, you know, you have to expect as much, right? But having said all that, it's it's all about Asia for China. Got it. Re the ambitions are, are are limited regionally, and it's you know they can they can tie together, I guess, if we buy into this new Cold War kind of framing. Um, but. So di diving into your uh, comment on U.S. foreign policy, I, I recall you wrote an article in 2016 in Strategic Studies uh, arguing that the grand strategy for the United States historically has been to ensure the balance of power in its transoceanic flank regions and keep them internally divided. Could you explain what that sure. means for sort of discussing how this might play out for the Biden administration's foreign policy in Asia and in Europe? Well, um, first, the title of this new Cold War, if you will, I had been very reluctant to use the word Cold War about U.S.-China relations until about three days ago. <laughs> and three days ago, the administration announced their new high-tech policy on China. And those of us who are old enough to remember who paid attention to these things. Um, during the Cold War, we had a policy where we wouldn't sell the Soviet Union a Jeep. We wouldn't sell them a truck because it was called dual use. They might use that truck to bring troops to, the, to, the, to their borders. So we wouldn't sell them a truck. Well, that's where we are with China and technology. This administration announced that any technology in quantum computers, to artificial intelligence, or chip processing that has any 
possibility of being used for military issues, we will not allow American technology to end up in China. And that includes American technology in a phone made by Samsung in wherever. That's very much a Cold War policy. And the President of the United States in his national security speech basically said we're going to increase our defense spending to prevent China from reordering the world order in their image. Now, mind you, I don't know what that means. Um, we should understand that any administration develops a public relations campaign to promote support for their policy. So in this room, for example, if the president says that his recent spending plan is going to reduce inflation, how many of you would say, oh, he said it's true, so it must be true? We wouldn't do that. But if the president says the Chinese are about to want to undermine the Western liberal order, oh, the Chinese, we accept that. Uh, we need to use our own critical abilities to understand China's role in the world because we need to understand any leader anywhere in the world is selling their policy. And I don't know what it means to say the Chinese are challenging the liberal world order, but that's what it said in the, pres in the national security policy, that we must resist China. We need to be number one. We may, must be number one. The image of the world order needs to be the American image, and we will not negotiate that order with China. We will establish it under American leadership. Sure sounds like a Cold War. Now, I'm sorry. What well, did you really ask me? <laughs> Just to explain sort of this, whether you think the Biden administration's sort of current policy, then this mm. moving towards this new Cold War, is that is that adhering to what, oh, what oh, you yes. identify as the grand strategy so of this sort of? When you think of from 1776, this is how embedded this is in our DNA, how hardwired we are. American leaders have understood that the security of the United States is predicated on East Asia and Europe being divided. So if you look at the, our victory in the Revolution War of Independence, it's because the French and the British were fighting each other. We never would have won the Battle of Yorktown if the British and French weren't fighting over Europe. We won, never would have gotten Florida. We never would have gotten the agreement with the British on, on the border with Canada. Every one of these. We never would have gotten the Louisiana Purchase, we know, because Napoleon was fighting his wars. And this has been American thinking all the way up to World War II, when we discovered the Europeans couldn't keep themselves divided because the Germans were going to unify the continent, so we wouldn't even keep it divided ourselves. And we think that way about um, East Asia. <clears throat> when Japan was marching toward um, a total domination of the Asian continent when it moved in into China, Franklin Roosevelt took steps that he knew might lead us into war, but he was going to resist Japanese domination of East Asia because both East Asia and Europe flank the American coastlines. And so we worry that if someone has hegemony in East Asia or Europe, then they have the wherewithal to not need to pay attention to their region and could cross the water and come to, come to the Western Hemisphere. Um, we, so that's always been, and so in a sense, that's what we're doing in Asia. We don't want to see Chinese hegemony. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is that thinking that grand strategy is so valid in an era of nuclear weapons when America is secure, because if ever were there a retaliatory threat that was credible, don't attack the United States. So we're not under fear of attack. And so you should ask that question about, about American policy. Does America need to be in Asia to be secure? Um, and that's something we all have to answer ourselves, because how much you would value that might differ than someone else who might value a health care program that's very expensive. But that's what we're doing there, is a belief that we cannot allow China to dominate Asia because whenever a country dominates the flanking regions, they may cross over and attack Washington with their navy or attack Pearl Harbor. Right. It, if I could push back against that, um, that response a little bit, I mean, I, you know, I would argue, right, that the U.S., right, it's not a choice about whether the U.S. Uh, should be in Asia, right? The U.S. has been in Asia since World War II with major uh, naval military bases in, in Japan and in South Korea especially. Um, and the, you know, the Obama administration's pivot to Asia was, I guess, I mean, they would argue rhetorically servicing this grand strategy that you're talking about mm -hmm. is preventing he Chinese hegemony mm -hmm. in the region, right? right? And you wrote a piece criticizing, I recall, the pivot to Asia, mm -hmm. you know, almost 10 years ago now. Yes. How do you sort of square that logic then? So, ideally, when you have a rising power, you find ways to adjust mutually 
so that you can both have greater security. No, so the rising power can have greater security, but the cost to the United States would be acceptable because the, you might have somewhat less security, but you're not going to have a great power Cold War conflict that could lead to war. So you're prepared to make certain concessions where the benefit is, great, is greater than the cost. Um, I argued against the pivot because I thought the United States was taking steps to respond to China's rise in ways that were unnecess didn't contribute to American security, but were provocative to China. And so you're creating greater U.S.-China conflict, which is costly. There's no free lunch out there. If you want to wage a Cold War against China, it's going to be very, very costly. And so I thought the Obama administration was adopting policies that were costly to the United States would not be successful, but were provocative. So one of them was, you know, after 1975, the fall of Vietnam, we forgot about Vietnam. It didn't exist. Uh, the Obama administration decided they were going to open up security ties with Vietnam. Are you kidding? No one noticed that we were secure after the Vietnam War. We didn't, you know, what are we doing in Vietnam again? They're not very helpful. It wasn't going to succeed because the Chinese had significant capabilities on the Vietnamese border. And all you were doing was provoking the Chinese. In retrospect, I feel justified. Um, in retrospect, we have given up on trying to have friends with Vietnam. The Chinese taught the Vietnamese a lesson, thou shalt not cooperate with the United States. The Vietnamese have complied. So all we did was succeed in doing was provoking China. The other one was we were intervening in the sovereignty disputes in the South China Sea. These islands are worthless, and despite what you may read, there is no oil in the South China Sea. There is no natural gas in the South China Sea. The United States government says, I believe, that the South China Sea ranks about 250th, maybe 150th, in terms of ranking of, 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 of underwater and above water um, potential energy resources. We're not there for oil. Right? Um, and so what we intervened, we were going to protect the Philippines, the, the international court ruled in favor of the Philippines, and then we walked away and bailed out and said, well, that really doesn't matter anyway, because we were not going to pick a fight with China over something the international court ruled, because after all, we never thought the Chinese were going to listen to five men sitting in The Hague in Europe telling them what to do. So we were doing this for politics, not for justice. The Chinese lost the decision, and then we walked away from the issue altogether, and we're not involved in it anymore. So my objective here is to try and think of ways the United States can adjust to a rising power in ways that gives them the security commensurate with their capabilities in ways that don't undermine American security. Now, just so quickly, the most famous case of this was the post-Napoleonic Wars. And Henry Kissinger's best book he ever wrote was about the Congress of Vienna after the Napoleonic Wars when the foreign ministers of Austria, Hungary, and Britain treated France like a great power, even though it was defeated because they understand that you treat great powers with respect, you give them the security they need, and then you will not have wars. And Europe had 100 years of peace, practically. So that's what the, the ideal thing to do is, treat China like a great power, and I thought we weren't doing that. So one of the, er the area probably of greatest uh, contention, most zero-sum issue between the US and China and Asia is probably over the status of Taiwan, right? So is Taiwan the next Ukraine? What lessons might the what might American leaders draw from uh, either the failure of deterrence or the success of sanctions? I mean, different people draw different lessons from this. And, and what do you think Chinese leaders, what lessons Chinese leaders might be drawing from Russia's struggle? In, the United in States Taiwan. had a Taiwan policy from 1979 to, let's say, 2018, where we lived in a fictional universe where we said Taiwan is part of China, and the government of China is the People's Republic of China, and Taiwan is not a country. Now, this is a fictional universe. Walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it should be a country. But you wouldn't tangle with a, a grizzly bear that was in your tent. You'd go the other way. And China is the 800-pound gorilla. Taiwan deserves independence, it should be independent, it should have its own flag and place in the United Nations, but the mainland's the 800-pound gorilla, we're not picking a fight. Why? In part because Taiwan strategically is useless to the United States. It's 90 miles from the mainland, totally part of the mainland military orbit, it's of no value. 
So let's see if we can find a fictional way to deal with this so we don't have a conflict. And it worked. For 70, 80, almost 40 years it worked. And we began to change that policy. And now it's fundamentally changed. We've hollowed it out except for the one policy line that we recognize. The People's Republic of China is the government of China, and we have a one China policy. Right? We don't support Taiwan independence. Otherwise, we hollowed out all the meeting. And the question is why we did that. And you'll hear people say that the mainland was becoming increasingly aggressive and assertive against Taiwan. We need to deter and bolster Taiwan's security so the mainland doesn't go to war. Well, there, and, and Ukraine fits in that. So we're all nervous, right? Well, this is a distinctly American mindset. If a country has the capabilities to go to war, they will go to war. No. War is really expensive. War is really dangerous. War is a cosmic roll of the dice. Just look at Putin. He wished he hadn't gone to war. Most countries, most of the time, don't want to go to war. So just because they have the capabilities doesn't mean they want to go to war. And we say that, that Xi Jinping wants to go down in history as a person who unified Taiwan. On the other hand, he doesn't want to go down in history as a man who went to war against Taiwan and didn't win. That would, the cost of that would be far greater than the benefits of unifying, because he'd be accused of being another Qing dynasty, Li Hongzhang, if you will, right? The last thing he wants. So first, Donald Trump changed our Taiwan policy by increasing strategic support for Taiwan in a number of ways. The mainland did nothing for two years. We call that patience. Second, there's not a single American general, not a single person in the CIA, not a single person in the State Department, not a single person in Taiwan's Defense Department or in the Taiwan's National Security Council that says that they see any indication that the mainland's preparing for war, and they see any indication that the mainland's even capable of doing an amphibious invasion. There is no mainland threat to use force against Taiwan. That comes from the CIA, it comes from the National Security Council, it comes from the State Department, it comes from Taiwan's National Security Council, it comes from Taiwan's Ministry of Defense. So why are we doing this? We're doing this because we're trying to contain China. And we're looking for partners. And every American partner in East Asia, except for Japan, is getting closer to China in recognition of China's power. And Taiwan says, we'll side with you, we'll cooperate with you, and the administration says yes. So we're using Taiwan in great power politics as a pawn, as an instrument, to cause problems for China. So we're back where we kind of started. What's the cost? What's the benefit? The mainland can do more. The mainland Navy is, about, is so much larger than the American Navy that what they need to do to deal with Taiwan's issues doesn't begin to interfere with their other activities. You're not containing China with our Taiwan policy. But we are provoking conflict with China, and you have to ask why we didn't stick to the original policy that worked so well for 40 years. Because we want to stop the rise of China. We have been the number one country in the world since, nine, since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, or 1989, Warsaw Pact, and we like it. We like being number one. We like having leadership and authority, and we don't want to give it up. Ukraine, the assumption is that they were preparing for war, and maybe they learned a lesson from Ukraine, and now they won't go to war. They weren't planning to go to war in the first place. And the reason they weren't planning to go to war in the first place, uh, they'd have to do an amphibious landing. An amphibious landing on the east coast of Taiwan, just the logistics and the landing would be exponentially more difficult than landing in Normandy. The beaches and the tides and the coast make a, a landing there horrifically difficult. Second, you'd have to suppress a population that hates the Chinese Communist Party. What do you do once you occupy it? Good luck. Third, this is one big urban suburban sprawl. I mean, it's not like the Ukraine, you can dr drive your streets down farm fields. Taiwan is mountains and suburban urban sprawl. So how are you going to fight that war? And finally, if those, it, it's mountainous. 
it's the perfect environment for a protracted guerrilla war. The mainland's nightmare is to attack Taiwan. I wonder, I have to ask this because the 20th uh, Party Congress is days away and, and President Xi Jinping will begin an unprecedented third term in office. Uh, many speculate now that he'll you know, rule for life and, and worry about how his, his personal views of risk and reward, right, and, and the, the vision of uh, national rejuvenation might play into the Taiwan question, but other sort of policies. Uh, how has the concentration of political power in the hands of one leader altered Chinese foreign policy? And does it have any implications for the United States, what we're about to see in a few days? So we do think about that. He is not a consultant. We ask, who is Xi Jinping close to? Who are his foreign policy advisors? And we just said, well, no one. He listens to himself. He may meet with this person, meet with that person, but no one dares give him advice. He gets a little briefing here and there, and he makes up his own mind. People worry because um, we don't know to what extent he is uh, well informed about the consequences of his decisions. Um, having said that, his personality seems to be caution, caution, caution. Don't rock the boat, but once you make a decision, go all in. Get it done, and then consolidate. Mao was like that, too. Right? Consolidate your gains. Um, so this is a rising power, right? And rising powers are known to be fairly assertive in using their new capabilities to reorder a strategic order so they have more security. After all, the United States kicked the British out of the Caribbean because we were a rising power, and we didn't want the British in the Caribbean, right? I mean, this is what great powers do. Um, and so he, this is his objective. He's got more power. He doesn't like the US Navy being able to sail up and down with impunity on the Chinese coast. He doesn't like the US Navy and Air Force having bases surrounding Chinese coastal waters and Chinese land. So he's going to use his power to try and reorder the alignments and the security environment in East Asia. And he's been quite successful. He hasn't killed a single person. He hasn't invaded a single country. He hasn't fired a single shot in another country since 1989. That, and yet he's been successful at the same time. So the personalities matter. You can't say that about Putin. right? First he invades Georgia, then he inv takes the Crimea from Ukraine, then he has a full blast invasion of Ukraine. They're a very different kind of leader. Xi Jinping is having remarkable gains in East Asia with, if you will, being Teddy Roosevelt. Walk softly, but carry that big stick with a little gunboat diplomacy in here and there. If, for a rising power, that's not a bad leader. Um, there are many leaders out there around the world who would be far more frightening sitting on that kind of power. So you don't buy into the counter narrative. Uh, my advisor, Susan Shirk, has a new book about overreach that it's sort of the turn of uh, Chinese foreign policy and leaders towards uh, asserting greater interests, uh, wolf worry diplomacy, you know, and, and Xi Jinping personally being uh, attached so to that this robust This is an interesting view. case study, this <laughs> book. So we live in our, all academics live in our disciplines, right? Are you political scientists, are you sociologists? And even within our disciplines, we can have our specialties. So with all due respect to the author of this book, she studies Chinese domestic politics. She knows very little about international relations. If you study Chinese behavior from the perspective of the politics of great powers, talk about wolf diplomacy, right? And so we think that wolf diplomacy comes out of the bowels of China or out of Xi Jinping's head. Well, we have to remember the context. The greatest wolf warrior at that time in, US, in the world was Secretary of State Pompeo. Right? He was going around the world using China, plagiarism, attacking China here, attacking China there. So what did you have? The Chinese were attacking in response. We had these great polemical wars, most of it over Europe. We call China genocidal. Well, they're going to attack back. Um, we say that China is, um, um, we we're trying to deny China's Huawei to Europe and attacking them for, for infiltrating the security systems. They're going to attack back. The reason why 
wolf warriors, wolf diplomacy caught on is because our allies in Europe were more susceptible to arguments against China. So when China says America bad, they don't hear that. When America says China's bad, they do hear that. So in many respects, the Chinese made a mistake. They should have not taken the bait from the Trump administration because it hurt China more than it did the United States. But the second part is, we think of China overreaching, and what we do is we watch public opinion. And if you look at all the public opinion polls in Asia and elsewhere, so thinking of China as a cooperative country or a constructive force, it's declining. Right? But then we need to ask ourselves, well, does public opinion matter? Well, most of the world, including Russia and China, it doesn't matter at all. And just to give you an example, in our last election, China ranked 16th of importance in how Americans vote. So it's not clear it's important in America. So that we tend not to look at public opinion to s and say China's overreached. We say, what has China accomplished, despite public opinion? And you see every country in East Asia say, we don't want to take sides between the United States and China, except for Taiwan and Japan. They didn't say that 10 years ago. 10 years ago, they walked in lockstep with the United States against China. Now they say we're not taking sides. That's a major accomplishment for Chinese security. Second, 10 years ago, Americans treated the South China Sea like it was Lake Michigan, American Lake, we went where we wanted. Now the Chinese are, are equal in the South China Sea. That's been a major accomplishment for China and Chinese security. So does it come as a price? Yeah, no such thing as a free lunch, right? No pain, no gain. So yes, they push back, and they received major pushbacks, and what did they get? They got a Cold War with the United States. That's the price they paid to be a rising power that's been successful at achieving their objectives in East Asia. We have to, they have to ask themselves, is it worth it to have the Americans off your borders, to have the American bases in East Asia no longer functional, so that China now feels greater security at the price of a Cold War? Um, and that's something they have to answer. My own sense is that great power politics being what they are and rising power politics being what they are, we're probably where we are, where we were going to be anyway, whether it's two years from now or four years from now. I shouldn't say that. We were going to be great power competitors competing intensely, regardless of where, how we got there. Whether it's a Cold War, leaders matter. And we're seeing a distinctly Joe Biden foreign policy right now. But this is going to be a very, very difficult relationship no matter what. Love to follow up on, on a whole bunch of things going on there. But I think, uh, according to my clock, uh, students are going to be preparing mics to uh, uh, prepare for Q&A. So I have one last question that I'm going to ask the speaker. Um, and that is going to be, uh, you know, we, we have... Uh, some current policymakers hopefully tuning in and, and certainly future policymakers in the audience. We have a lot of students here. What sage advice would you give to American policymakers, to the uh, Biden administration, for managing uh, U.S. relations with China and Russia in the 21st century? It sounds rather banal, but I would like to think our policymakers would focus on what's important for American security, not what makes us feel good or our identity or the role we want to play in the world. There's no free lunch out there. This is going to be a very expensive relationship. I mean, you want to compete with China, how are you going to get the money? You're going to, you're going to print more money? Well, we know that many people in this country believe that our deficits are far too high, we need to cut spending. Well, you, I don't care where you spend the money, you spend the money on the military, you're going to get closer to bankrupting the country. You're going to cut Social Security, you're going to um, cut infrastructure spending or education to pay for the military? I don't think any of us want to see that. Do you want to raise taxes? I, most Americans don't want to raise taxes. So where are you getting the money for this new Cold War? There's no free lunch. But if we rein in our perspective and say, what is necessary for American security to keep Americans free f from war on our territory and in vital allies, only vital allies around the world, and to keep our democracy safe, 
That's a much less expensive foreign policy in terms of budget and with far less wars out there. So I'd like to think of a, a restrained foreign policy that focused on what was only important in the terms of security and that we would, in dealing with China, so we get no cooperation from China on North Korea. Well, of course not. We've started a Cold War, X, Y, and Z, and we were undermining our Taiwan policy. We get no cooperation from China on fentanyl. We get no cooperation from China on Iran. We get, uh, John Kerry is our, uh, our climate change czar. He's sitting in the closet waiting to meet with Chinese leaders. Good luck on that one, right? I don't think any of this is a surprise to the administration. They know the cost of their policy is going to be a heightened conflict with China, and therefore they will not cooperate with American interests. They made that choice. I think there is a way to defend American security in ways that mattered. And mind you, China poses a major challenge to the United States. But I think there's a way to deal with that challenge in ways that also enable us to have the ability to cooperate and get Chinese help where we need it. And that's where I think we failed. And so I think, so I would hope that sage advice would find a way to manage this competition in a way that didn't preclude cooperation and didn't lead to heightened, costly, great power conflict and the danger of great power war. Well, peace and managing competition is definitely uh, something that I hope for as well. Uh, please join me, uh, everyone in the audience, in thanking Professor Ross, a Jay Jayhawk, uh, thank you. Um, and now we look forward to, uh, to your questions. When, uh, when the mic passes to you, uh, I'll acknowledge uh, the question asker and please introduce yourself and your affiliation uh, with the university or the, the Dole Institute, please, and ask and keep your question brief. Uh, in the front here, uh, we have uh, a student. And yeah, you can, if you have questions, maybe flag down a, a mic and he'll come, he'll come to you. Hi, I'm Charlie with the SAB. I was just uh, wondering so I know that a lot of the time that uh, like human rights issues are kind of bandied about like uh, as like political posturing, but how would you reconcile your image of uh, like a peaceful rise of a great power <coughs> with instances like Hong Kong and Xinjiang and like the border dispute with India in 2020? <coughs> Two different sets of issues. One's human rights, one's India. Every country in the world spins which means we need to have some humility to be able to say, I don't know. And anyone who thinks they know what happened at 15,000 feet in the Himalayas on the Sino-Indian border is delusional. No one knows what happened up there. No one knows who started that war. Chinese will say the Indians did. The Indians will say the Chinese did. No idea. Maybe there were fisticuffs on the border and it just elevated, escalated, who knows? So that one I'll just put aside and say they got an uneasy relationship, but in the scheme of things, no one's fighting a major war at 15,000 feet. You just can't. It's cold up there, right? You know? So it's not a particularly dangerous border in terms of war. Um, the other issues you raise are more difficult. Let's begin with the premise, not the premise, the fact. The time in China is a human rights disaster. Xinjiang is a human rights disaster. The surveillance state in China is the most repressive surveillance state in the world. I'll say that too. What they did to Hong Kong is tragic. What do we do about that? And that's the problem. So let's take Xinjiang, for example. Let's go back a step. No government likes minorities. No government. Because they believe that minorities are not loyal to their own government because they do not like to be ruled by a different ethnic group. So no government likes minorities. China's no exception. So when they get as repressive as they do, it's because they fear terrorism or... Um, internal rebellion in distant provinces. So that's why they're repressing. It's not because they enjoy repressing a minority group. 
They think like politics. So the problem is that if we do something to try and help the people in Xinjiang, there are three problems with it. First, it won't work. There's no way the Chinese government is going to say, oh, America is opposed to our policy to maintain stability in Xinjiang. I think we'll allow the people in Xinjiang to be more anti-Chinese Communist Party. Never going to happen. We fought wars to make governments better. We failed. We've had sanctions on Cuba since 1960. We failed. There's no way that we can make the Chinese be more kinder to their people. Second, it might actually make it worse. Because, and the first rule should be do no harm, but the Chinese believe that we are cooperating with Xinjiang separatists. So if the Xinjiang people reach out for Americans for help, well then that threat that the minority poses to the Chinese government got worse. Because they're cooperating with the Americans to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party. And so then the repression gets worse. And then third, to the extent that you do try and help the people of Xinjiang and others, you are saying to the Chinese government that they are an illegitimate government and that they should step down peacefully. And then you're going to ask for their help elsewhere. So Hillary Clinton was on a plane going to China in 1993. And she was asked by reporters, are you going to raise human rights with China? She says, no. It doesn't do any good. It just makes things more difficult. And she got hammered in the media. And since then, after that, the Clinton administration had a human rights policy. Right? It's not a pleasant conclusion. Because we want, it's, it's a human rights nightmare, and you want to be able to make a difference. And you want to be able to speak out on your values. But if you're not going to do any good, and you might actually do more harm, not only to the Chinese people, but also to yourself because you're making it more difficult to get cooperation that could help the American people, well, you're better off just shutting up. But it's not something that's easy to do given our values. Hello, I'm Julie Martin. I'm a political science student here at the University of Kansas. With everything that has been talked about tonight, how do you think social media has impacted all of this? Well, we talked about Chinese repression and fear works. It just does. The great firewall of China means that social media around the world cannot seep into the Chinese internet world. Very difficult. Second, all cell phones must be registered in China. So if you post something on a, on a social media platform, they know who posted it. People go to jail for that. Fear works. There is no significant independent voices on social media in China. What are you going to do? Um, Chinese used to talk about winning the hearts and minds of the people of Taiwan. And maybe it was possible. But then the people of Taiwan started going to China and seeing family and going to universities and getting jobs, and they discovered, oh, I can't use Gmail in China. I can't use Facebook in China. I said, I don't know if I like China. And all of a sudden, the people in Taiwan stopped thinking about getting along, or maybe we could expand cooperation with the Chinese Communist Party. The reality is, is that it's just not a nice place to be. Okay, let me, uh, let's actually circulate. I think we have a lot of hands, and so I'm gonna ask to collect two questions at a time. So can we have uh, up front here? Um, and then I think there was another hand behind this gentleman. Yes. Yeah, my name's Phil Karada. I graduated from KU in East Asian Studies in 1968. Robert Burton, mm -hmm. uh, who I still revere. Uh, the question is, how, what do you see uh, in Japan's relations with China in this growing uh, age of uh, rising tension between the U.S. and China. Thank you. And then behind the gentleman. 
Ambassador Japan. Um, I'm Bila, and I'm also a political science student. And one of my questions was, so we've already established that there's like this Cold War that's already brewing, but like in our class, we're learning about like trade and the economy. So we know that China is one of those people that we trade with often. So what is their um, economy is going to look like from now on? Excellent. Economic interdependence? And yeah. Japan. Um, okay. So we, we think about Japan. Why is Japan different than every other country in East Asia, except for partially Taiwan? Well, it's big, 115 million. Second, a lot of water between China and Japan. That helps Japan. Third, it's got a lot of awful good technology and a very good military. And anyone who ever thought Japan was a pacifist country, no. They got the, one of the best submarine forces, one of the best air forces in the world. Right? This is a great military. Um, and third, it is a fourth, it's the most important American ally in the world. So we used to say that about Great Britain during the Cold War. Because the British were not on the continent, we could have a massive deployment of American capabilities that were secure from the mainland. Well, without that's what Japan does for us today. Without Japan, America cannot be an East Asian power. We need a platform in Asia that has water, hospitals, spare parts, big bases, everything. And that's Japan. And what that means for Japan is they have a lot of confidence in the US commitment to help them and defend them. So they're a lot, they feel a lot less vulnerable to Chinese power than South Korea, the Philippines, Vietnam, Singapore, because this alliance is so important to American security. At the same time, it vacillates, but sometimes, most of the time, China's their number one export market. So they are going to try and collaborate with the United States any way they can without getting involved in America's Cold War. And that's the way every American ally is. America wants to fight that Cold War, you go ahead. Um, but the Europeans have said, we're not decoupling from China. We need China. Japanese are that way. Koreans are that way. So, and they've been successful in doing what they need to do for their security while not aggravating economic and political relations with China. South Korea has been that way. Other countries have. Um, the United States, part of our Cold War policy is to try and mobilize the world to do what we're doing. They don't want to do what we're doing. And so one of the efforts we're having is to try and bring them into a polarized system. And so the president's technology policy is clearly part of that because he's saying that if there's an American technology in your cell phone, Samsung, you cannot, sell your sa you cannot sell your cell phone in China, or you can't make your cell phone in China. Maybe, well, maybe you sell it too, I don't know. Um, we'll see how that works, but it's clearly an effort to coerce countries to choose. You cooperate with the United States or you cooperate with China, you can't do both. We had questions in the back, let's take another two. Um. Hi, uh, my name's Mark Osborne, my connection with KU, chemistry degree and medical degree a long time ago. Um, my question just has to do with India is soon, soon going to be the most populous country and a rising power also. How do you think over the next 10 to 20 years their relationship with the United States and China is going to be and how is it going to affect our relationship with China? So, Oh, sorry. Let's oh, take sorry. one more. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Owen Miller. I'm an undergraduate student here at KU. And uh, my question is, last week, President Biden said that the risk of nuclear war is at the highest point it's been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Do you agree with that? And if so, why or why not? It's related to India has nukes too. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me try and answer a little bit more of that trade issue. Um, We're in a trade war with China. We're in a tech war with China. The administration is betting that we can win. And we can derail the, ray, the rise of China as an economic technological power. I don't know, but that's their bet. Ch 
China is in deep trouble for the next three or four or five years. One, because they've destroyed their economy with their COVID zero policy. Two, because of COVID zero, people's savings are gone, so their consumer spending is not gonna bounce back after COVID. Third, their small businesses have no money because of COVID. And fourth, the world is going to be in a global recession, so their exports are going to plummet. Now, everything's relative. So when we look at newspaper headlines, the Wall Street Journal says China's got issues here. Then the Wall Street Journal will have an article over here, U.S. inflation hit so-and-so. No one puts it together. Everything is relative. Who's in worse shape? I don't know who's in worse shape. We've got massive inflation. It's going to be followed by a recession. And then how long does it come out of a recession? I don't know. The point is we can't look at the Chinese in a vacuum. Everything is relative. On India, first a correction. India is not a rising power. It is a declining power. Why? Because we measure power relative to the other countries. And China's economy is still expanding the GDP gap between the two because China's economy is just so much larger than India's economy that it can grow slower and still expand faster. Second, India's technology is falling behind China's technology every day. Third, the Chinese Navy is falling behind, is, is Indian Navy is falling behind the Chinese Navy every day. And fourth, the Indian economy remains totally dependent on trade with China. This, you know, the joke on India is that it's a dagger point at the heart of the Indian Ocean. We really don't care. And then the other one is a potential great power and always will be. We're still waiting for India to get their act together. Population can be a drag or it can be an asset, and for India, it's been a drag on their economy. Um, why is India important to the United States? Countries have allies for two reasons. They help them fight wars. India is not helping us fight a war. They're not fighting a war at 15,000 feet, and they don't have a navy. The second reason is because of geography. They give us a, a presence in a part of the world we need. Now, the dirty little secret about the United States is we are retreating rapidly from East Asian waters. I mentioned earlier that all these countries in East Asia are moving toward equidistance. Well, if your allies move toward equidistance between the United States and China, they're worthless to you. You need to have, a you need to have confidence in your ally that it's on your side, and these allies are saying we're not on your side. And we see the trend in the South China Sea where we're becoming at minimal China's equal, and that's no way to have a security order. So we're retreating. We have a, you know, we've put one aircraft carrier visit into Singapore in the last three and a half years. Where have we been? We've been elsewhere. So what we're doing with India is India is valuable to the United States because it's, a, its east coast and its islands are very close to the outside of the South China Sea, outside the Malaccan Strait. So we can encircle the South China Sea, and China never gets out. We are retrenching, retreating to the Indian Ocean, the Western Pacific. So we're going to contain the Chinese inside. And India is a valuable partner in that. And the Indians are scared to death of the Chinese because the Chinese Navy is all around the Indian Ocean going back and forth between the Persian Gulf. And where's the Indian's Navy? It's nowhere. So where's the Indian Navy? The Indian Navy is the American Navy. So that's what we call a common interest. They need our Navy, and we need their coastlines and their islands. And that's going to be the next 20 years. That's not going anywhere. Nuclear weapons, or should we worry? Oh, nuclear weapons, thank you. Well, that's a low bar, <laughs> right? And yeah, Cuban Missile Crisis was really up there, and we didn't have a, second, we didn't have a single crisis with the Soviet Union after, after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Things settled down. So this is the first time we ever even thought about nuclear weapons since the Cuban Missile Crisis. So yeah, it's the worst nuclear, it's the closest we've been to nuclear war since the Cuban Missile Crisis, but that doesn't tell us anything, because it just means it's, it's more than anything else since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Are we close to a nuclear war? Well, you know, I don't, you don't want to be overconfident in these things. So you say no, but you don't want to say we're, we're not close, therefore we can do whatever we want in the Ukraine and not worry about it's, it's the Russians using nuclear weapons. No, you will still want to be really cautious because you don't want to make a mistake and then find yourself in trouble. But, and I give, the, I give the president credit. Very early, those of us who remember, there was a great amount of pressure on the president to establish a no-fly zone over Ukraine. And he said no, and he came out really strong in the first three or four days, said we will not do 
a, a no-fly zone over Ukraine because we're not shooting down nuclear, we're not shooting down Russian planes and we're not killing Russians because we don't know where that will lead to. And what he was clearly saying is we're not going to get involved in a U.S.-Russian war that could escalate to nuclear war. And he shut that debate down so fast we don't hear about it anymore. No one talks about no-fly zones anymore because he shut it down with the fear of escalation to nuclear war. So on the one hand, I don't worry about it because I think no one wins a nuclear war. On the other hand, that doesn't mean we can act recklessly because there we may find ourselves in things we can't control. We have time. Let's collect two more questions. Yeah, in the... Uh, hello, I'm John Lubinetsky, an undergraduate political science student. My question revolves around Central Asia, specifically what Central Asia will look like uh, in its relationship with China after the Russian-Ukrainian war. So during the war, it's fair to say that Russia's position in its periphery has been slowly declining as its capabilities are uh, diminished by fighting Ukraine. So in a post-war war Central Asia, will China change its interaction with Central Asia in any meaningful capacity, or will it be more of the, the status quo as it is now? So, oh, sorry, one more. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Nate. I'm an accounting major here at KU. And my question was, um, you mentioned the world is heading towards a recession, as we can kind of see, um, and just increased tensions with China and Russia. What do you think like the best move is for America? Um, that could probably put us like in the best situation for the future. So in Central Asia, with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the Russians had no army, no economy. I mean, nothing. Nothing. And in the 1990s, the Chinese economy soared and over 20 years ago, they started building pipelines in Central Asia. And that was, of course, an unfriendly act toward Russia because it meant that, so during Russian, when it was the Soviet Union, the Russians built pipelines in Ukraine or um, in, in Uzbekistan and in this part of the world, and the oil went north into Russia proper and then took a left turn into Europe. And the Russians made money off of it. Now all of a sudden the Chinese are building pipelines in Central Asia, so the oil's going to China, and the Russians are losing some income. And second, they're losing influence. So the Chinese have been penetrating into Central Asia ever since the 1990s, and the Russians haven't lifted a single finger. They have been passive in response to Chinese advances in Central Asia because there's nothing they can do about it. They are not a great power. Anyone, I mean, I mean, look at, I mean, look at Ukraine. Can you imagine them trying to deal with the Chinese? You know, forget it, right? So add to that that much of Central Asia borders China. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. Well, you know, they look up every morning, their leaders, and they look around, and what do they see? 1.4 billion Chinese on their borders. Well, that means you have a decline of Russian influence. So what does the Ukraine mean for this? It just consolidates and, and exacerbates Russian dependence for its survival on good relations with China. The Russian Far East would be Chinese today if it weren't for China's generosity. There are no people there. There's no infrastructure there. And so the Russians are not going to challenge China. They haven't challenged them since the 1990s, and they're more dependent and weaker than ever. Um, they need Chinese money, they need Chinese markets, they need Chinese technology, and they need Chinese help and just, Putin needs someone to hold his hand, almost literally, while he's picked a fight with the rest of all of Europe. So it consolidates and, 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 and escalates that trend, but doesn't really change anything. We, Ukraine hasn't changed anything except European politics. 
hasn't changed U.S.-China relations, hasn't changed Chinese foreign policy, hasn't changed South Korea, Japan, hasn't changed India. The world is moving on. The world sees this as a European problem that the Europeans can't figure out how to keep their house in order. Plague on your houses. You go figure it out. They don't see this as, as Russia violating global norms about invading other countries. There are wars all over the world. We invaded Afghanistan. We invaded Iraq twice. No, once. We're, we're bombing Syria. I mean, you know, they don't see this as violating global norms. They see this as European countries are, are at each other's throats because they can't figure out how to get along. Um, and so it hasn't changed anything. Um, the second question was, if I could reframe it, uh, you know, can we afford a Cold War with a recession on the way? So, what would be the best policy? So, I said we're a massive retreat in Indo, in from the South China Sea, and I said the Chinese Navy is just growing, you know, amazingly fast in the United States and overtaking the United States rapidly. And it's already overtaken the United States, and it is growing much faster than the U.S. Navy is. So. Two things. The U.S. Navy's preferred policy today is what they call divest to invest. And what they mean by that is they know they're getting no money going forward. They know we have no budget. They know we have budget deficits off the, off the charts. They know they're not getting enough money. They know they don't have the shipyards to build more ships. They know they don't have the labor to build more ships. So what they want to do is get rid of a lot of their older ships and less useful ships and save the money of, of maintenance and keeping an operation operating and use them to build new ships, which means we're going to get weaker before we get stronger. So the Navy's request for the budget for the following year requests that we decommission 30 ships over that year. This is an initiative by the Navy to make themselves 30 ships smaller. This year they decommissioned I think 12 ships, well, no, 16. You can say we're, we're, we're basically up to almost 50 ships decommissioning in two years. This is a smart policy. We do not have a Navy that is appropriately designed to deal with China. And it's incredibly expensive to keep this inappropriate Navy at sea because they're old, they require extensive maintenance, and we're keeping older ships at sea longer because we don't have enough ships. So our sailors are, are tired and not performing well. And so the Navy says, we're going to get smaller. I think that's a wise policy. Second, I think we need to use this policy carefully because you don't want to pick a fight with another country when you're getting weaker. This is truly realism here. You're inviting the other country to do nasty things to you if you pick a fight with them and you're getting smaller and weaker. If you're getting smaller and weaker, pick your battles wisely to make sure you come out the other side healthy. So I would pick my battles, restrain, divest to invest. Now the, the other thing is the secretary, the, the, not the secretary, the, um, the um, chief of naval operations, CNO, has said it will take 20 years to write the Navy. That's a very dangerous 20 years. That's a dangerous 20 years. But we have to be wise in those years to try and stabilize our environment. We have uh, Professor Kennedy has a question here, and I think some, uh, this lady's been waiting very patiently. Um, thank you. Um, Marlene Merrill, I'm just a community member. Um, I, uh, uh, the way you describe President Biden is kind of as an old school kind of thinking in terms of, of how he operates. And I wondered if you could contrast him to what you see as the thinking process in terms of foreign relations of uh, the Vice President, uh, Camille Harris. Oh, well, I don't think she Let's has a foreign policy. Well, no, but <laughs> she has no experience out there, and we have no understanding how she thinks. And the difficulty she's had with the media in the past means that she is following the script to a T. 
And the last thing she needs now are bad headlines, given in her rocky start. So that I don't think we have any evidence of how she thinks. She's, so she's been in Asia recently, and I think they wrote her script real carefully. I think we had uh, quite a few hands still, uh, so maybe we can collect all. I think oh, we're, sorry. we're close to being out of time. So Katie, and then <laughs> in the front here, and, and then to John, and then hopefully you can, you can maybe, okay. Okay, two, two more questions, and then if we have time. Uh, okay, yeah, two last questions, okay. Okay, uh, Katie. Uh, my name is Jack, <laughs> PhD student here at KU in the history department, studying diplomatic history, so I'm curious as to like, so after the Ukraine war, uh, with a weakened Russia, um, do you see that China would have a different foreign relations with Russia in terms of maybe pressing on some more of those uh, territorial issues with, with Russia that were not addressed during the Cold War, like the, the, the one in North Asia, the, uh, just in that region, yes. Usuri Islands again, and then Katie, uh, Hi, I'm Katie. I'm a master's student in global and international studies. Um, do you see any uh, issues of mutual interest between the U.S. and China that would encourage a shift back to cooperation over competition? So on, I'm sorry, what was the one word, what would you? Territorial disputes. Ah. With, uh, so by the late 90s, this China and the Soviet Union and Russia negotiated an end to every territorial dispute. The, the border is fully demarcated. The islands are fully negotiated and resolved. There is no more territorial dispute. Um, but you don't need a territorial dispute to have a border problem, right? Um, one of the one of the sayings we might have in international politics is that. Border disputes do not cause conflict. Conflict causes border disputes. So if there's a border dispute that, ex that escalates between China and South Korea, it's not because they don't agree on the border. It's because South Korea is doing something China doesn't like. And it's using that border dispute to put pressure on South Korea. So one can imagine the Chinese saying, well, we're not really very happy with what the Soviet Union is doing, Russia is doing. Maybe we should put some troops on the border and see if we can move the border a couple of hundred miles north. And what would the Russians do? Well, they don't, they, you know, uh, what could they do? That's why the Russians keep their nose clean. There's nothing the Russians could do. And the Chinese are happy. They don't want to pick a fight with the Russians. They've got enough on their hands with the Americans, right? They like having looking north and seeing Canada, right? Um, there's, there's no there there. This is a very... St so there used to be Americans who would say, maybe if we divide, if we have a better... Before Ukraine, if we had a better policy toward Russia, we could stabilize the U.S.-Russia relationship in Europe, and the Russians would focus on the rise of China. No. We should stabilize the relationship in Europe. We should get the Europeans to carry our burden, because we got enough of a problem with China. But if we did that, it, the Russians wouldn't turn on China. Again, the Russian Far East has no bases, no airports, no people, no infrastructure, no economy. Um, most countries, we think of Russia as a great power. Forgive me for being a little historian here. If you go from 1840 to 2020, you're dealing with 19, 180 years. That's about right, 180 years. Of those 180 years, the amount of time the Russians have been, quote, a great power in East Asia is maybe 30 years. The rest of those 150 years, they've been irrelevant. They are not a great power, and for one very important reason, weather. When Americans went west, they found California. We kept on going west. When the Russians migrated at the same time and went east, they found Siberia, and they just didn't want to go there. There's no one there. And what was the other question? Uh, areas of cooperation, a positive note to end on. U.S.-China yeah. cooperation. What, what bright spots do you, do you That's see? That's a tough one. <laughs> so, I mean, you pick the usual ones, Iran. Well, as long as the relationship is what it is, the Americans have an interest in keeping the Americans worried about war, worried about Iranian nuclear weapons. 
Well, they're not going to help us solve our problem with Iranian nuclear weapons when we're doing what we are to them. We could, so the issue is not where we have a common interest. The issue is where might we get cooperation with our interests from them, and where might we be able to cooperate with their interests, and you know, we call this a quid pro quo. If we had a different kind of relationship, we might be able to do a little cooperating with each other's interests. We get, now, the Chinese look at the Korean Peninsula and think they own it, or increasingly so, so that they no longer need to cooperate with us on no North Korean nuclear weapons because they don't care what we do on the Korean Peninsula because they see trends on their side. In the past, they had to be kinder to South Korea because South, they didn't want South Korea to get too close to America. Well, with the rise of China, they're confident South Korea is going to get closer to China. Um, so there's no common interest, but we might get Chinese help on North Korea if the relationship were different. And we know what the quid pro quo is. Kind of know. One is Taiwan, right? There's a lot the United States can do on Taiwan that wouldn't change Taiwan security, but would make the Chinese less nervous about trends. Now, the trade war, right? It is in President Biden's interest to find a way to alleviate some of the tariffs that hurt American industries so as to help American industries and simultaneously to help to ease inflation. The secretary, the trade negotiator, went to the Chinese and said, we're thinking of doing this. Will you help? Will you reciprocate? Chinese said, no. You picked up the rock and dropped it on your own feet. This is your problem. You started the trade war. You tied the knot, you untie it. So we're not getting their help. We're just not. Now, that's, then why doesn't the Biden administration make a unilateral concession and say, there are certain tariffs the Trump administration put in that are not helpful and are counterproductive for the American people, and he won't do it. Now, part of that's politics. But part of it is there are people in the administration who want to wage a trade war, who do not want to show signs of weakness and believe that we can win and bring down the Chinese f model of, of, of economics. And there are, there are a lot of people who just want to wage a trade war. So until we figure, we're not going to get their cooperation. Happy to end on this uh, note of the trade war. Come work with me at the KU Trade War Lab. Um, <laughs> Uh, but thank you very much. I think there's more questions in the audience. Come chat with us afterwards. Um, but thank you, and thank you to thank Professor you. Ross for coming to Lawrence. <laughs>